the second portion of the semester, and as I say, this is not a class for music majors, as we know. So um, we're going to talk about 20th century American opera. And we're going to go back to the beginning of the century again, where we started last uh, portion of the semester. We started with Charles Ives, right? We're going to go back to approximately that point in time and work our way up again, this time a little bit more quickly. But before we do, I just want to ask, when you think of opera, what is it you think of? What comes to mind? It can be anything. It can be pejorative, or it can be favorable, or neither. What do you think of when you think of opera? What's opera? Anybody? Yeah. Singing, belting out, okay. Someone else? Yeah, come on. Costumes, absolutely. Who else? Kyle? Um, usually that like Baroque style music. Baroque style music, okay. People screaming on stage. People screaming on stage, okay. Anybody else? Drill? Uh, I mean, I think more specific things like Carrie Marie Opera or Sweeney Todd or um, things that I've seen. Okay, then we're getting into the realm of what we call operetta or musicals, and we're going to talk about that a little later. But um, basically, opera is simply sung drama on stage. It's acted out and sung. It's a drama on stage. It's just sung. And it started out opera in around 1600 to revive ancient Greek tragedy. Has anybody ever seen an ancient Greek tragedy? Anybody know the story of Oedipus Rex? Mm -hmm. Not exactly a bowl of laughs, a great work, but pretty tragic, right? And in fact, um, much serious opera really began as a way of trying, in some ways at least, to imitate or revive ancient Greek tragedy. That's why when we watch some operas, they become very tragic and not they don't always resolve in happy endings towards the end because of this um, interest in becoming very dramatic and tragic. But comic opera did develop later on as well, so there, there are operas that are considered to be comic. But for our purposes in this class, where we're going to discuss 20th century American opera, um, one of the things we want to do is to get out of the way two terms. One is a term called aria, and the other is a term called recitative. Anybody ever hear of these two words? Anybody? Well, basically, recitative is usually music that's sung to usually further the plot. It's designed as what we might call a form of heightened speech. So what do I mean by that? So if, um, if I ask Tom here, either Tom Leonard, to, to go and close the window. Now, I don't have a singing voice, but if I'm singing a few pitches like, if I'm going, Tom, would you close the window? And Tom sings back, Close it yourself. Well, I've asked him to do something, and theoretically, maybe in this story, there's going to be something outside the window or what have you. Who knows? But it's part of the plot. And in a regular drama, or even lots of Broadway musicals, <coughs> although not all, um, that's just where the speaking on stage takes place. But in fact, in traditional opera, um, recitative is that moment where we're having conversation usually and helping to further along the plot. Are you with me? But here's the deal about recitative. It's not designed to be extremely melodic or it's not designed to be an extremely beautiful quote unquote melody. In fact, a lot of recitative only uses a few pitches. Why don't you go and open the window or what have you? Are you with me? 
And so that way, it's supposed to sound a little bit like speech in that we're not going to use very many pitches, but it is some. Are you with me? That leads us to aria. Now, these are originally Italian terms because opera originally began in Italy. Aria is generally, I mean, if you wanted to put it in colloquial terms, we could say an aria is just a song. Aria is the moment where the person sings a beautiful melody, usually, often, I should say, to express feelings and emotions. And sometimes the character is singing to the audience about their feelings and emotions. And sometimes they're singing their feelings and emotions to another character on stage. So if Tom sang, get it yourself, or close the window yourself, and I'm really upset because he told me to close it myself. So I might walk up to the front of the stage and sing to the audience about my grief, about me feeling hurt that he told me to go close it myself. And it's a beautiful soaring melody, perhaps. And in that, I'm communicating emotions and feelings. It's not designed to further the plot, except just to let the audience know about my inner feelings. Are you with me? And that's where aria comes in. And opera often contains both. Now, that's a generalization. First of all, there are times where a chorus might sing on stage. That's different from either term. Um, there are moments where you might have four or five people singing together on stage. But in general, those two terms will be useful. Why? Because at some point in opera's history, sometimes some composers decide not to use recitative and instead just to have spoken dialogue on stage. And then arias. Are you with me? <clears throat> so at some point in certain operas, composers decided to have someone just speak to Tom. Tom, would you close that window? And Tom will say, no, close it yourself. And I still might go and sing that aria that I'm hurt or what have you. You get the, you get the idea? Now, that leads us to ask a question. In your mind, what's the difference between an opera and a Broadway musical? And it depends on what kind of opera. It depends on what kind of Broadway musical. But do you have any ideas, generalizations that pop in your mind? This is not based on asking you to research anything yet. Yeah, Tom. Well, it's an opera. Um, the drama is sung. I guess a musical is it's used to kind of use the dialect or the accent or the break. So that you mean a lot of musicals have spoken dialogue, you mean, on the stage? OK, good. Yeah. Operas like drama, but the Broadway, they're not really always about drama. Not always about drama. OK, now here's where we get into a little issue. You're right in that opera began as a very serious form. But at some point, people started to also write comic opera. That's meant to be funny, obviously, and often has a happy ending. So now we get to Broadway musicals, and there are some musicals that are very lighthearted and funny. As a matter of fact, the term musical didn't really come about until 1943 with Rodgers and Hammerstein creating a work called Oklahoma. Before then, the term was called musical comedy. But when we get to famous musicals, Broadway musicals like uh, Carousel, South Pacific, these are Rodgers and Hammerstein musicals, there's a lot of serious stuff going on in those roles. So now the question is, well, now how do you tell the Because if opera sometimes has spoken dialogue in place of recitative, sometimes it can have recitative. And 
If opera sometimes can be comic, although sometimes it can be serious, and it was began as a serious form, then how do we distinguish between Broadway musicals and opera? Yeah, hi. Uh, well, from experience, it seems that opera is a whole lot more concerned about the music rather than telling the story. Okay, that's an interesting point. Yes and no. I think one of the things about opera is originally opera for people, English-speaking people, is that it was in a foreign language, in Italian. But, for example, when an Italian opera came to America, they'd often translate it. It's a lot of times, that originally, they'd have people sing it in English. They don't do that very often anymore. They usually have subtitles on above the stage to let people know the translation. So it might seem that the story might seem a little bit more remote because it's in a foreign language. Are you with me? Yeah. Plus, in opera, there's usually an emphasis on vowels. In Broadway, there's often an emphasis on consonants. How does that change you as an audience member? What's the difference? If someone's singing on stage and they're emphasizing consonants, and uh, someone else is singing on stage in an opera, and they're emphasizing vowels, how does that affect your hearing of these words? Anybody? Lauren? Um, I guess, it, are the vowels dragged out longer? Ah, and so what does that do for you as an audience member? That's okay. You're, you're, you're on to it in terms of what you said regarding dragging it out longer. There's, there's other ways to put it, but you're on to something here. I just want to go further along. Which can you more easily understand? The consonances, right? If someone's pronouncing consonances instead of just singing vowels on stage, it's easier to understand what they're saying. Are you with me? <coughs> And if it's easier to understand what they're saying, then Kyle, the story is a little bit more obvious to the average listener. Are you with me? The story is just as important, often in opera, not always, but because there's an emphasis on vowels, we're often a little bit more remote from understanding the story, coupled with the foreign language, if it's in a foreign language. Are you with me? And also, depending on how many singers are in here, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to sing. How many people sang? Okay, Daniel. Well, it's also um, how you're trained in singing. Because a person trained as an opera singer will have a little different sounding voice than a singer in many musicals. Although we have to be careful because there are different kinds of musicals. But usually, for someone singing opera on stage, what comes to mind? When you hear an opera singer singing versus someone in Broadway musicals, what's the difference in the sound of the voice, other than we just mentioned consonants and versus vowels? It's like loud and boisterous, kind of. It's loud, often, louder, mm -hmm. absolutely. And what is that? Wavering of the pitch that we sometimes hear in opera. It's when we go, oh, that, it's called vibrato. You know, we have to remember that in 1600, when opera was invented, they didn't have microphones. Microphones didn't come about till the beginning of the 1900s. And that changed things quite a bit. If you have a microphone on stage, you can sing in a conversational way, like you're just talking to someone right next to you about your story. But if you have a big theater, or even a small theater, and you have to project without microphone systems at all to the person in the back of the room, you have to sing loud. And that's partly how the tradition came about. 
I know that's a simplification, but in part,